Uh, welcome if you're following me on watching this video on YouTube as well. Uh, this is going to be the first in a series of videos that I'm doing to try to introduce some of the old hidden gems of content, uh, first edition through. Uh, man, I'll be looking at some, some B slash X or Beck me, choose your preference, basic ex expert, companion, master, and immortal. It's the Beck me acronym. BX is its current uh, official designation. Um, First edition, second edition, a little bit of third edition, probably not a lot of fourth edition, um, but looking at some of the old modules, some of the old settings, some of the old content, and uh, just kind of giving you a preview and a, a preview slash review of the thing, maybe a little bit of insight to what to expect if you play with it, and uh, importantly, some tips on what to consider and how to translate it for your fifth edition adventure. Um, I've been playing since 82, 83, got the basic for Christmas, and uh, that also got me advanced at the same time. It was kind of an interesting trying to learn, you know, between the two of them. Pick what you want. Don't, you know, that's D&D that's &D for you. It was a necessity back in the day, and it's even, you know, something we still play with a lot now, homebrew. Um, off and on, off and on, I think mid-late 90s, I had switched over to Twilight 2000, Cyberpunk 2020 video games, and uh, a little bit of Magic the Gathering, but came back a few years ago for, uh, oh gosh, a dozen years ago to try out fourth edition um didn't really like it felt like warhammer ultralight it felt like they're trying to turn uh D, D into world of warcraft and then put it back on the on the table as D, D. was not a fan love the content didn't like the, uh, the system a little older now i you know i'm not gonna bother going back to see if I, it's worth giving another try because no, no one plays it but yeah, I did, did jump into 5th edition, and uh, I DM a lot of campaigns, a third-party content producer trying to make maps and modules and guides and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you can find some of my stuff on Etsy, follow me on Patreon, uh, subscribe as a patron would be even cooler. YouTube, uh, Facebook, it's all DM Geezer Jim. It's all going to be spelled the same way. And, uh, search for my stuff and like and follow and subscribe and all that and, and help me out. Uh, join me in here for some chat, some comments. Uh, if you're on YouTube, love to hear back from you on what you think. Um, I'm here to present content, present information. I'm not trying to present myself as an expert. Uh, just an old dude who's gotten back into 5e, trying to share some of his experience and opinion. And, and hopefully just provide uh, options to provide, uh, you know, different ways to look at things and, and, and help you. Uh, kind of segue stuff. So all of that being said, um, tonight we will be looking at the classic module for, um, it's called WG5, approved for use with advanced D&D rules, published by TSR back in yon days of the, 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 the day, um, titled Morning Canaan's Fastic, Fantastic Adventure by Robert J. Kuntz and Gary Gygax, the OG's along with Arneson for the creation of Dungeons and Dragons, transferring it from Chainmail to D&D, &D, um, generating the, the world of Greyhawk, the setting that everything takes place in, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to get all sidetracked and go into a Greyhawk rant. Save that for its own stream. Different settings, similar to Forgotten Realms, Eberron, Theros, Planescape, blah, 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 blah. All of these are settings, and this just happens to be called Greyhawk. Morden Kanan is probably a name that you'll recognize if you're a 5th edition player. He appears in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, he appears as a senile, bubbling, babbling fool in um, one of the in a couple of the campaigns. He appears as a detached observer slash MacGuffin esque in a couple of the campaigns. He appears, uh, makes a lot of appearance in 5th edition. He was originally Gary Gygax's player character when they were starting the game, built up, and and as all of us DM, DMs are wont to do, um, characters that have a lot of fun amongst the playgroup become legends that continue forward into other campaigns through influence. So we are all living under the influence of Morden Kanan becoming a great and powerful wizard, da, da, da. Right? Okay, cool. So, um... Morden Kanan's Fantastic Adventure is a little bit different from uh, a lot of the modules in that number one. Well, not a lot. Let me rephrase that. 
the majority of the vast majority of your old modules, what we call adventures back in the day, were self-contained, two or three maps, 25 to 30 pages, and almost without fail, they all came with pre-generated characters, okay? So I don't want to make it sound uh, like the, the WG5 Morton Canaan's uh, was unique, but it is unique in the fact that it's one of a handful, I think one of two modules that you actually get to play as powerful members of the Circle of Eight. At this point, you're being Morden Kanan, Big B, Rigby, and Yirag, Gary Backwards, just to be simple. I'm going to call him Gary Backwards the rest of the day. Um, adventuring near Greyhawk in the days of their youth prior to them becoming super powerful wizards is basically the, the premise that's given to your party. Alternately, you can bring your own players uh, provided they're level 9 to 12, according to the adventure book. So um, I'm going to give you a quick scan, if you will, of what these things look like. You bought it. The cover was, this is the front of the book, the back of the book. Um, it came with a couple trifolds inside of them. One of them was a fold out that showed you exactly where in the hex that this map is located on the overall Greyhawk world, you could find Castle Mar, Mar Castle. The second was a trifold that gave you the actual map of the dungeon. This is what the floor plan, and if you play D&D, you're familiar with, with what this looks like. Um, this has been a consistent feature for Adventures Modules campaign books since the beginning of time. One thing to keep in mind is... This was back in the days of, of drawing mimeograph typesetting and all of that. Not a whole minimal computer generation processing. So these are all hand drawn to keep in mind. Uh, number two, they're gridded at 10 feet. So some of these areas are huge. Specifically this one here, you're looking at something the size of a football field on the, uh, the lower part of the map here. I'm going to zoom in just kind of show you what I'm talking about here. The area is 17, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, by scale, it's 200 foot across, 300 foot wide. Big, big area. So scale is a thing to keep in mind when you're looking at a 5th edition dungeon versus a 1st edition or 2nd or whatever edition. Uh, things are scaled a little bit smaller. 5th edition, we work on 5 foot squares. That lines up pretty well for pacing, sizing, um, balance. And uh, lines up with miniature use. Five inch, five foot equals a one inch square, so it all translates. So if you're doing theater of the mind with this dungeon, keep in mind that you're going to have to, have to, have to um, describe large areas in some cases and very cramped areas in other. If you're using any sort of mapping program, we map in five foot squares. Typically, these are listed in 10 foot squares. Your map's going to get big, 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 big. But if you got a program for it, great. I use Campaign Cartographer. I can map, make the map no problem, run it in virtual tabletop no problem. I don't know that I could make a pretty enough map of a 300 by 200 foot area to work for the free version of Roll20 with a 5 meg file in it. It is what it is. Spend the money, become a subscriber, get ma bigger maps, make crappier maps, whatever you're going to do, it's your call. Uh, different VTTs have different size files, requirements, costs, and all that. Not here to argue VTTs. Just here to say, if you're using this for 5th edition, be prepared to use some mapping tools, multiple maps, dozens of maps, especially if you're playing on a large table, potentially, to represent your area. This is a... a this particular dungeon has several large, large areas to account for. Uh, so that's number one. Um... Number two, this is written in first edition lingo, first edition numbers. Uh, never expect any sort of consistency in the presentation, except for your stat blocks are typically normal. Um, and we're going to scroll down to a couple monsters and zoom in just to do it. Um, quick translation methods. If you're using B, Beckme, first edition or second edition, this will get you within 90% of where you need the monster for 5th edition without a ton of work. A couple mathematical formulas to remember. Okay? We're looking at the Tyrg here. And I believe this Tyrg Spotted Hound is actually around in 5th edition. Could be wrong. Um, 
frequency rare number. That's that's we're not going to worry about super details right now. I'll do that on a different one just for the purposes of now. Uh, armor class for fifth edition twenty is your perfect armor class, or first edition zero is your perfect armor class. So in every situation, you're going to take twenty minus which is the the fifth edition armor class of 20 minus whatever the first edition armor class or Beckney armor class is. And um, the result will give you your remainder will be your fifth edition armor class. So what's that? That sounds crazy. Armor class 20 is our base, always our base. Armor class 5, 20 minus 5 is 15. So the tier for fifth edition purposes will have an armor class of 15. It dies 5 to 8, same as 5th edition. So that's going to give you between a range of 5 hit points to as high as 64. 5 plus 64 is 69. Looking for the average, average is going to be 35. So the tier has an average of 35 hit points. Okay, simple math. Take your hit points, get your range. Attacks are attacks. They're, they're going to line up the same number of attacks. Should be the same as your 5th edition stat block. Some things can hit once, some things can hit five times. Depends on it is. So that's going to translate directly. Uh, special attacks, special defenses, you'll have to read into the description and either A, find a similar power, or B, make it up on your block if you're a D&D Beyond user. Um, level XP value is the next thing you care about. 5 HD, call that a fifth level. Five levels, we're not trying to compare it to a character class for anything other than uh, determining a proficiency rating to add to their damage and their roles, okay? So if I go with the 8 HD, then I'm going to say he's an 8th level. So we're going to add 8 to their attack hit, their stat bonus plus their proficiency. Half of that number will be their proficiency, a plus 4. So that's what you're going to add to their stealth, their perceptions or whatever depending on everything else obviously low intelligence would mean they're not going to get that proficiency on intelligence checks you leaving yep same one or just yeah i'm happy with it i just like i said most of the time it'll, i'm sorry i'm getting a new mouse picked up if I'm they sorry. don't have that specific one just get something like it yeah pretty close so to it i just the bigger the better i like this one because it was big and I mean, if you can find something like that that's cheaper, that's fine too. I just need a, a slightly larger mouse so I don't. That's the problem with the smaller one. I squeeze it, and then it ends up. I'm sorry. Okay. My daughter's hooking me up with with tech support mouse pickup. But anyway, uh, armor class twenty minus whatever is listed on your first edition block gives you your fifth edition armor class. Twenty minus five equals fifteen for armor class. Uh, level H XP value. You're going to take that. That's going to give you your plus to hit. Divide that for your proficiency, okay? Divide that for your damage as well. You don't want to give plus 8 to hit, plus 8 to damage, plus 8 to hit, plus 4 damage makes sense. So if my group comes across this stat block, I'm going to take it one step out here. Um, let's just pretend I'm actually translating, playing directly from this while we play, okay? Takes practice to do it, but it is completely possible. You don't have to spend a bunch of time typing the entire thing up. Let me just find a group of monsters. Um, we're going to go to Huben. Okay. He's a magic user of 8th level. Oops, did I, I? There we go. Thank you. He's an 8th level magic user, so that gives you your basis for your proficiency and, and, and uh, spell bonuses are all listed there. Uh, armor class of 5. 20 minus 5 is 15. So he's going to start with an armor class 15. Movement of 12. I forgot to do movement. The number I found is you ignore the inches. That was for tabletop. Movement of 12 is a foot per uh, combat round. Okay. Things broke into segments. and We're not getting super detailed. So take that number. Ignore the, the measurement. Divide the number by 12. Multiply the result by 10. 12 divided by 4 is 3 times 10 is 30. So that gives you a standard movement rate of 30 for your human humans. And, and most of your average your average standard speed is, is going to be uh, 12. If you look over here at the tier, it's got a 15. So I'm going to divide that by um, 4. 
3.5. Yes, 3.5 times that is 35. So his standard movement is 35. FYI, the tier is what we were looking at earlier. Remember when I told you the average hit point was what? 36. This one gave a 32 hit point to it based on five hit dice. Easy. Uh, special attack, howl equals stunning effect. So, so you're going to save versus wisdom or be or constitution or be stunned within a 20 foot radius when it howls. Save versus wands on uh, or penalties of minus one on initiative. So he's got a faster initiative. Um, if you aren't are, uh, minus two to hit in the last three rounds. So, quick note that's just telling you what his special ability in first edition ease. This cruise over here. Hit points 31 has been determined. Attack 1, damage 2.5, 2 to 5. He's hitting with a dagger. Uh, strength, intelligence. They For NPCs, a, a good product will give you your stat bonuses so you can get a little bit in there. Um, scroll of 3 spells. So you get into Hugh and he has his spells. Uh, once you get your numbers down, everything else is the same as 5th as edition. His spells are going to be the same as a cultist spells or a cleric spell or an evoker spell list from your stat block. You could just use an evoker for him if you wanted to. Not a big deal. So don't be intimidated or put off of using older content because you're afraid it's going to be hard to translate. It's, it's a little bit, but most of the time you can kind of shoot off the hip. The most important thing is to understand the flow of the module. Don't worry about the stat blocks. Worry about understanding the, the 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 module. Once you've read it a few times, once you understand the flow of the adventure, um, you can make the adjustments to the stat block yourself, or you can just drop a fifth edition monster in on top of it. Uh, author commentary here. I'm always going to recommend that you learn how to translate and, and make the stat blocks. Uh, I'm not trying to disparage fifth edition, but I would bet if you took... Fifth edition does a good job of picking up most of your of your BX and one and AD and D first edition monsters. Most of them, not all, most of them. Um, I think when you take the second edition monstrous appendixes and combine them in there, you go from having seventy percent represent sixty percent representation to thirty percent thirty percent representation. You take your third edition splat books, which while third edition is a number grind from hell. Man, their content is awesome. Their content is outstanding. The Splat books, the Lords of Aberrations, the Tyrants of Hell, all those books are great, great content. Take the time to learn how to transfer, translate 3rd edition to 5th as well. 5th um, edition never has to publish another thing. Once you learn how to work backwards, you have an entire universe worth of stuff to do. And, and I'm not trying to disparage 5th edition. I'm not trying to disparage Wizards. I'm not just trying to disparage any of that. I'm trying to say that most of what you're playing right now is derivative of something that was made before. Um, you have access to the source documents through DMs Guild, through friends, through whatever. There's, you know, you can find legal use PDFs all over the place if you're an asshole. I, and I do not support doing this. There's other ways to get stuff that you shouldn't be doing. It doesn't, I know, oh, screw TSR. Well, you get in the habit of screw everybody. You know, if you're going to steal from TSR, what's the big deal of stealing from DM Geezer? Um, do you, do you, big deal from stealing from Tyson logos. I see their map. I pull the snap. I put it on my game. What? Fuck them. Okay, that's fine. Small content producers get screwed. Try to get in the habit of doing stuff legally. Make sure you know the dudes that can make a dime. Let them make a dime off of off of you know if you're going to use their product, especially if you're going to play with old content. Spend the three dollars on the PDF. Get the content. Have it available and and go. But that's my quick rant on that. Libraries. I have in an ex in excess of fifteen gigs of PDFs that are just Beck me in first and second edition. A couple third editions thrown in there, and it's not even a complete collection. But that's all content that I have available to bring into any of my campaigns. That's all worlds that I have available to bring my fifth editions into those worlds. So, man, don't be afraid. Don't be in intimidated by the stuff out there. Jump into it. Get in there, man. Even if it's Google searching some of what I'm talking about, finding something that's interesting and taking that trail, do it. Do it. So anyway, I'm going to do a quick test here. Um, I'm going to go back to my 
that and I'm going to switch to that. Okay, cool. So, um, I didn't, I just had to manually switch between the two. So I am going to, I tried to stream a little while ago, had issues with sound, had issues with a couple audio things, uh, wasn't happy with it, threw that one away, trying again for, for both uh, YouTube and for the Twitch. I don't want to go room by room like I started to last time. I think that's going to be really time consuming. I don't think anyone really wants to do that. Um, would, would wants to listen to me go for four hours and basically walk you, play you through the dungeon. If you're interested in hearing me do that sometime, let me know. I'd be happy to present Dungeon that way, kind of DM it for the audience and then break it down for uh, in mechanical terms. I, I might do that with a shorter module, but this one is 62 locations deep, spread out over three levels, with lots of quick, uh, with lots of interesting, convoluted, and just plain unfair traps. Um, it would take me probably five or six hours to go through this and that level of detail, and I'm not prepared to do that yet. I want to give you a view of it, an overview of it, review, preview, talk about some of the cool things involved in it, and then um, get going. But yeah, it's a pretty, pretty complex 67, excuse me. Um, so the number one cool thing about this is your players are playing as Morden Kanan, backwards Gary, Rigby, and Bigby when they're on ninth, 10th level. Uh, the characters are relatively well equipped um pretty well set up they're not op honestly i, I don't want to get, uh, digress into you know different campaigns equip at different levels it's it's a moot point to try to say right or wrong they're decently well equipped for their level they're pretty well uh stat stat wise and all that they're not min maxed they're they're realistic um and they hear that something is happening at castle mar mar castle an old ruin sitting in the middle of the swamps that's been ignored for decades by most people. Uh, someone comes up swearing up and down they've been there, so the predecessor of the Circle of Eight hops on their magic carpet and flies on across the the area. They're going from this city of Greyhawk over here, shoo, over to Mar Castle. Southern Cairn Hills hidden in the woods in a marshy area on the border of the Aber Alls Mountains. Cool. Right? Um... The first thing is there are some built-in MacGuffins. This was a module that was built between Gygax and some of his friends when they were building D&D. So they kind of went back and filled in what I would almost question if it was kind of a beta test. Um, they started playing with this this actual location in 1972-73, uh, which was before anything was really published. So it was kind of a revision backwards to go look at stuff. Um, it's got a, I'd suggest picking up the module. It's got a little preface that was written by Gygax talks about how his, uh, experience as a player went the first couple of times they went through entertaining read and, and some, some historical information on the module. Not a lot of background given for why you're going. Ironically, even though there's history for how it was written and who and preface, why it's here is kind of left up in the air. Old modules will mess with the DM. You have to read from beginning to end because most of the time, if you look at a new a new adventure book, the first chapter, which is cool for the DM, shitty for the DM because the player can read the first chapter just as easily, tells you the gist of what's going on. Where are you going? What's the next section? Who's the big bad guy? What's the overall plot? What to look out for? What to prepare for? Okay, moving on. Sometimes in modules, that's buried way 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 back man and this is one of those cases until you've read the whole thing you really don't know what's going on here or even why the group's going um i'll just to save us some time the 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 morden canaan and his bros are headed down there because it's not even supposed to be a thing and bringing some sort of strange magic evidence in a demonic taint with the survivor of the last expedition is enough to get them interested. And that's enough of a hook, man. They hop on their magic carpet. They cruise down. They get to the tunnel, the, the, to the castle. It looks the same as it's looked every other time. Um, about a mile away, they notice a new redoubt, a new trench, a new digging, is, if you will. Um, kind of a small excavation, and there's a stone tunnel. 
and the tunnel leads down into the ground 30, 40 degrees. It's up to you as a DM to decide. Uh, 3,000-ish feet before it hits a left and a right, and the left disappears another 3,000 feet at the same descent into a dead end. The right goes down like 100 feet and ends in a room with the door. That's where the inventor is going to pick up the unopenable doors. Now, from a fifth edition standpoint, unless you give, you got to change it here or you got to give them the silver key of portals that Morden Cannon has. That was a plant at the beginning of the, um, of the beginning of the whole thing is here, Morden Cannon, you have this key that you can use up to four times a day to open any portal whatsoever. So the only way to actually get into Castle Mar is through a pass wall, uh, not a pass wall, a uh, uh, plane shift, be able to turn ethereal or astral up here on the other side of it, use a wish spell or use the key. So keep that in mind. If you do that, you need to give your group the same kind of, some sort of MacGuffin or you make the door op openable. Um, now I'm here to tell you long-term, the adventure's cool. There's some fun fights some fun set pieces, but it doesn't make sense as a dungeon because if it's been cut off for all of this time, why does A, B, C, D, and E happen? I, why is it inhabited? Why is there a, a working military ranking culture in certain places of it? Where are they getting access to food, water, air? All? So that it this is one of those that doesn't do a great job on the ecology. But you know what? It's a fun place to go check out. So there we go. So they get through the first doors. I'm going to switch over to the first level map if y'all are okay with that. And... um. Yeah, so if you look on, on, on your screen right now, you should be seeing the the map of the first floor. There's a hallway in the northeast of it, a little X that leads down to um, the first hallway and goes down to the number one and the door there. That's the unopenable door that they use the magic. Where that X is, that's the left, i.e. the north, that continues on to forevermore, who knows where, uh, 3,000 feet into a dead end. Uh, they come into here. Um, most people are going to gravitate towards the middle room, which is kind of silly why they make number two, three, and four off to the side. But in the middle of this is a gigantic fountain full of this amber yellowish liquid. Looks like water. You just can't really see to the bottom of it. The reality of it's a 70 foot diameter, 75 foot diameter, 10 foot deep wall, uh, pool of water. Stone platforms seems to be floating in the middle of it. And there's this big chalice floating above it. Uh, water's full of, uh, they're called het fish. Kind of a homebrew quipper type thing. They'll do swarm damage, but instead of piercing or biting or slashing damage, it's just heat damage. They just swim so quickly that the water temperature heats up and, and people take heat damage. If you're resistant, not a big deal. If you're not, it can suck. Um, the other rooms along the top are just kind of, uh, of storage areas. Not a lot really going on through 9 to 14 to 15, although 15 is one of the if they can work their way into there, that is a way into level two, finding the trap door in the corner, making it through the other trap door, navigating a spear trap um, is, is great fun in room 15. Room number two, uh, room number three, over on the eastern side of the map area, or western side, excuse me, are, are player traps. Uh, two is interesting that it's, it's a magic disposal. Um, if your players walk in, they have to make a save. I would honestly probably make it as a wisdom save, a, uh, intellect save because of the, the arcane buzz. Um, you could make it a wisdom save if you wanted to. It'd be one of the two DC or at a high level. So I'd make it a DC 18. Uh, if you want to be really mean and get rid of some items early on, make it a DC 25. If they have good skills, you roll high enough. Whew, that was a close one. If not. There's a table in the module that has them breaking down, um, oops, has them actually breaking their weapons down. They'll put X amount of items in these, in these holes, and these holes chomp, 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 and crush it all up, and they lose items. So someone can have really bad luck, become enthralled for six rounds, roll bad enough on the second table, and each round they will continue putting one of their items from most valuable to least valuable into this chomp, 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 chomp thing. One person fails to save, not the end of the world. All people fail to save. All of a sudden, you've disarmed your par par party. That's fun, but maybe not. And more importantly, the way it's the wording as written is they'll use whatever item in hand. 
So you could very quickly and easily break your whole module if you gave him the silver portal key. If your caster, Morden Kanum, his player was careless enough to use the door key on dumber, door number one, keep it in his hand as he went to room two. That would be the first thing they drop. Interesting mechanic, crappy. Uh, room three is another trap. It's a, it's your typical illusion type of a trap. There's a candle next to each of the four doors. If that candle gets blown out, uh, there's a candle near each of the four doors. If the doors are disturbed, uh, the, uh, and on each door is a warrior is painted, a fresco of a warrior in chainmail ready to jump. If the candles are, are, are knocked out, if the flame goes out, the warrior animates, attacks the group. Uh, I'd say they're roughly about gladiator level uh, CR five ish type guys. Could be a challenge for a group of four people getting jumped. Probably not um, enough to give them an hour or two and to get on with their day. Rooms four, five, and six are a series of of um, I'd say trap. There's an oni, a uh, ogre mag magi as I used to call them. Uh, in room five, he's kind of cursed, trapped there, making... Uh, he's a tailor. He makes magical items, but most of them are cursed. And I don't want to get into a ton of details, but there's a bunch of really cool um, items that are listed in the module that the players think they're getting this, but in reality, they get that. Uh, I mean, just for shits and grins, give you an example real quick. Um, he'll tell them they're getting some gauntlets of swimming and climbing, and as long as they're within the room with him... There are gauntlets that will do that. The moment they leave, they become envenom gauntlets, i.e. the person puts them on, contact, poison, save versus poison, or die. Yeah, there was a lot of save or die back in the day, and it, it stays consistent with the module. <clears throat> Slippers of speed. You think you're getting double your movement of speed when you're in your room? Once you walk out, you actually have a slow spell cast upon you as long as they are equipped and worn. Cannot be removed except by the use of a dispel magic, uh, dispel magic, or a remove curse, both cast at twelfth level, or by use of a wish. So by twelfth level, that's a big thing. You, uh, it, I guess even now you would have a, a what a DC seventeen or so to to make the save to dispel the spell. Challenge to get them. Cursed items, lots of fun. Socks, sweaters, hats, robes. Sashes, all that. So the, the Magi will trap them in there with that. Um, and then that's really it. Like I said, uh, there's a secret trap door in room 14 that leads to 15. If they're quick, if they're thorough, they can bypass the big event in uh, the upper level and get to the lower level. Um, I'm just kind of thumbing through this. A little bit of art here and there. For example, that's the picture of the fresco and the candle. If you uh, are into visual aids, you know you can you can show this is what it looks like as you get into the round room. There's a spear trap they have to deal with in room fifteen. Um, uh, let me get back over to the. Uh, so yeah, the upper area is not a whole lot going on in there. Um, they go through these pillars at area sixteen. Uh, it's called the uh, the Great Draperies. So it's just this gigantic set of curtains that separates this monstrosity of a room and some columns holding it up. One could even say it was it was one big room that forms the first level of the Lower Castle Mar. However you want to say it, whatever. Um, they pass through the curtains. They see these seven, uh, these what is it? Six ivory pillars, each thirty feet high, five foot in diameter. Um, almost look like they're carved out of some sort of great bone or, or, or a tusk or something. Um, they sit there inanimate until the actual event starts here. Now this, um, hold on a second. I want to make sure that you guys are actually seeing this map and, and I'm not, uh, talking about something that you're not seeing on the stream. I would feel really, okay, cool deal. Damn it. I'm getting paranoid. I've had some technical difficulties the last few times I've run, been running stuff. So, um, the second part of this room is a gigantic event. Uh, it looks like to the left and right, 18 on the east and west wall, look like viewing stands because they are. They arch up 15 above the main floor. 
uh, seems to be like four booths, 15 seats per booth would hold 60 people. Uh, they start out empty. Everything starts out doing nothing. Uh, you pass through the curtain, you pass, pass the, uh, your party will pass the, uh, big ivory columns off to either side of them. They see the big old, uh, grandstand benches and they approach the central statue in the middle, uh, the throne area. It's a 50 foot by 70 foot raised area has three statues, each kind of tiered up, um, here, let me switch over views and you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Again, kind of gives you a little bit of artwork for it. So, uh, yeah, when the, when, oop, click off, come on, stop moving your view. But yeah, this is what the party approaches at the southern end of that large amphitheater. And this is the exit to the first room, okay? Uh, it's a huge staged event. As they approach, uh, the first thing they'll see is a, a fighter on the lower tier made of iron depicts a swarthy fighter in a lab elaborately crafted plate mail armor the visor is open he stares downward he holds an outthrust longsword if the characters attempt to remove the sword uh his hand will turn into flesh and release the grasp on the sword only one of two weapons that will harm the iron golem uh against the golem it has a bonus to damage and bonus to hit um if this half ton statue is removed there's a cavity below it containing copper and a copper urn containing jewelry worth a lot of money, gems, and so on and so forth. So if you can move the statue, there's a stash of cash underneath it. Primary thing is it's it's like it's holding its sword out, like it's going to smack at you if I, if you look at the picture right. Um, if the party grabs a the sword, they can take a sword. The second thing is a magic user. He's got a dagger in his hand. Um, if an adventurer attempts to remove the dagger, the statue will transform into flesh and come to life. Instead of attacking, it will immediately kneel and present the dagger that it's holding to the people. Then it'll return to its statue form and sit there. So the well, second weapon that will hurt it. Uh, the middle creature is an iron golem seated upon a granite throne. It holds a crystal iron-hewn sword in its left hand and a whip of interwoven feathers in its right. It's a hyped-up iron golem. Um... Iron Golems for 5th edition are tough. So, uh, for 1st edition, they like really, really tough. Uh, they added some extra abilities to it. Long story short, this is what is supposed to keep the people from going into the lower levels. Now, the guide gives you a good series of... If you're not familiar with how to fight it, older modules do a pretty good job. Well, I don't want to say all. This module does a good job, despite of, of its logic inconsistencies, of helping the dungeon master administer a given encounter. So it tells you when it's using its whip to do this, and uh, does this, use these abilities, um, and it changes the conditions once the golem attacks. So when you have a set piece like this, you definitely want to spend a few minutes reading it. Basically what's going to happen is uh, when the golem comes alive, whether the party has the weapons or not, it's going to fight them. As the golem chases them around that giant room, let me switch back to the big old room view, uh, comes off this platform, chases them around the room, those big ivory pillars that they pass through are going to animate, and they're going to be covered in um, faces. Some of them, a couple of them are big faces that kind of almost turn to face each other like they're chatting with each other. A couple of them are clusters of amalgamations of dozens of faces that'll start jeering and cheering and shouting. Ghostly forms appear and fill up the the uh, the boxes on the outside. So, um, you know, the the at this point, it becomes this big, gigantic arena fight. Um, so the DM, at this point, you're really... You need a kind of, of 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 really kind of play up the fact that there's this whole spect spectatorial thing going on that the golem's going to kill everybody and, you know, there's a bunch of ghosts and talking pillars that are enjoying it. Um, they, you can do more or less with it if you want. Uh, if the party's getting that butt kicked by the golem, you know, you can maybe uh, have something reach out of the pillars to slow the golem down. Um, you can give them inspiration from one of the pillars if they need it, you know, if they land a blow, Hey, great shot. And, you know, so, so use some creativity to make it more than just a gigantic golem beating the hell out of them. 
Do you have cursed uh, cursed souls stuck in these these grandstands watching this fight repeat itself ad nauseum? You have these gigantic six huge ivory col uh, columns that come to life. You can give them a little bit more oomph. If it's too easy and the party's whooping that golem ass, turn it the other way. Maybe the insults that are coming down, they're getting vicious mockeries from the... Uh, from the statues, the, the the crowd swells against them. They're filled with this foreboding, this foreboding panic. Give me a wisdom saver. You're going to be working with disadvantage next turn as you lose confidence in your ability. Big set piece to, to kind of liven it up for your party and, and, and make a tough fight into more of an entertaining atmospheric fight. Uh, and that's a lot of kind of, of what really goes on with your with your older stuff. So once they get done with the first level, they're going to actually make their way into the second level, whether that was through the secret door. And let me switch. Um, oops. I'm going to leave this up because I think I can. I might have done a bad. Let's. Oh, I didn't do a bad. Yay. It lined up kind of okay. Let me adjust a little bit so you guys can see a little better. Apologies. Dungeon level two keyed up. All right. Let me switch over to make sure that you guys are seeing that on my... Yay, cool. All right. So whether they have gone down through um, the secret door that was found up in 15 that actually leads to 27 here, if I'm right... Or, uh, oh, let me confirm that. Let's just see, where does the door for 15 lead? If they make their way down the stairs, uh, deserted chamber, door to the north. Boy, 50, 16, so. Should that be 27, I think? 20 leads from the golem. Twenty-seven. Oh no, that's just a fake stair up on fifteen. It actually doesn't lead anywhere, or does it? We're looking at the map here. Let me zoom in on my side. I know it's a little rough to see there. I've got an access to dead end to twenty-seven that leads down. Thirty-eight leads further down, I think. Secret door to thirty-eight or thirty-four. Okay, thirty-four to fifty-three. So yes, it's going to lead into your twenty-seven. Twenty is going to lead from your golems. Um, twenty-seven is a human. Con uh, twenty-seven level two is is a a primarily human controlled uh area there's a lot of of actual non-player characters there's a dude named tomorost eli tomorost that in according to the story has moved in in the last 10 months or months or so and started making castle mar and the hidden dungeon below his own thing so he's the mid-tier bad guy He's being influenced from things that are going on below him. He's just, they are just not familiar with what's going on. Um, there's a little mini cult forming up. There's some other wizards that are magic users that are, are serving under Tomorost. And a, a handful of fighters, a handful of, of melee centric, if you will, people. Um, honestly, this is a grind. This is a dungeon crawl grind. Uh, let me switch back over the map for yours. You're looking at about 20-ish uh, rooms, a couple of them large. There's not a lot of really freaky encounters like what, you're, um, what you saw up on the upper level. Um, there's a pool that's full of acid if you stick your nose in it, but it tells you you're, it's unwholesome. It smells like crap when they walk in. Uh, room 30 is a chamber of fumes. Um if the party spends too much time in there, they can take fire damage. Uh, there's some specters hidden in one of the rooms. Most of it is just kind of a, a storage area, a living quarters, a support for the, the NPCs that are down here. I want to say, what, two seventh level fighters? 
Eli Tormoros, two Spectres, Cuban, three, four, five. All of the lower level is going to be occupied by approximately six, seven, 14 NPCs spread out through everything. Um, you're looking at the map going, well, it looks like a lot more than that. Well, let's just look at room 30, for example. It looks like there's a bunch of cross hatching driven on, dr drawn on it. That's the Chamber of Fumes that I was just describing. So some of the effects that you're looking at, the best they could do to draw it, to, to represent it versus what we have for modern, modern digital art. Um, second level is designed, in my opinion, to frustrate, to confuse, to obfuscate, um, to keep the party from finding what they need to move back on. Uh, this was... This sounds... Funny, but this reminds me a lot of the the there's B1 into the unknown. One of the dungeon levels is drawn like this, just a lot of loops upon loops, doors upon doors, uh alcoves that don't really serve a huge purpose. Uh for example, if you're looking right around 30, you'll see 28, 29. Uh stinking chamber, unholy pool. You have all those alcoves off the right that aren't used for anything. The stairway comes down, dumps the party into a kind of a dead area um probably about 20 percent of the rooms aren't even marked so this is where exploration becomes a thing if you're running by theater of the mind be very specific be very detailed in the values that you're giving the party because when you're looking at that map the challenge is navigating it not a bunch of stuff that's going to run around to each it's not like there's a a million things that are going to kill you. Feel free to add them if you need the challenge. But just navigating level two is is the challenge in my in my opinion. So if you're running virtual tabletops, use your fog of war. If you're doing it, uh, if you're playing live action or or live tabletop with miniatures, uh, just draw the minimum necessary. If you're using the um, you know dry erase, if you're printing maps, just print section by section. Make sure to to enforce upon the party they have to pay attention to where they're going um i'm going to do a little zoom in on my side here uh oh shoot no that's my sigil chat background apologies um scrolling up to the map going to do a click, 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 click zoom in and uh maneuver it ever so slightly so for here, we're looking at section 37. What's the whole point of it? By the key, there's no monsters in 33, 46, or 37. It's just designed to confuse and frustrate. And where are we going? Where are we at? What are we doing? If your players are seeing the map as you draw it, if you're drawing it, leaving it all out for, they don't know where the edge of the map is, know where they, they're going to ignore these sections of the dungeon. And if you want to make it smaller by cutting these sections of the dungeon out, replacing it by just one hallway, that's your freedom if you're redesigning it. But as drawn, as presented, I firmly believe that this section of the dungeon is here as a, as a puzzle unto itself. Sometimes we think puzzles, we need Rubik's Cubes on, on, on podiums or or you know, figure out the weight of an African swallow carrying 26 watermelons because he's got a girdle of giant slaying, stupid shit like that. Sometimes the whole damn room is a puzzle, you know? You look at this section up here. It's like you've got a door that leads to three other secret doors that don't lead to anything. You got a whole series of small little closets that haven't been assigned a value. Creative DM can turn that into a, a one of these is a, a gelatinous cube. And the moment you open the door, it starts... Blue, 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 blue through the hallway. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do and you have the, the, the freedom and flexibility to do. Um, but keep that in mind. So as a review, in my opinion, the second level of Castle Mar is not that impressive. Uh, the second level of Morden Kanan's Fantastic Journey Adventure is not that fantastic. Um, you're going to have to do some work to make it fun to make it more engaging than what it is or you're going to have to do a lot of work to make sure that the 
environment, the design of the dungeon works to thwart the players, works to frustrate them. You know, I've, I've uh, like ran a group through Dungeon of the Mad Mage and part of me, there's like 20% of me that is concerned that the group is having fun because I know once they took that right turn, they're going to travel for about 150 feet through five more turns, hit a false door, trigger a pit trap. You know, I know this. They don't know this. And, you know, a group, that's five, ten minutes of playtime. If they all fall in the trap, that's another ten minutes. So you've taken 20 minutes up of a game session, sending them down a dead-ass hall to a trap. Once in a while, that's fun, but you still worry if that if 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 that becomes a constant thing, then the group stops having fun. That's a challenge, I think, with this kind of a dungeon, uh, level two dungeon, is is immersing them in the confusion, the, the labyrinthine design of the dungeon. Not a lot of threats, not a lot of things are going to hurt them, but uh, just to beat them down, to wear them out. Man, I don't want to open that. It's just going to be another closet. Why bother? Well, you know, that might be the one that leads us to where we need. Oh, it was just another closet. You're right. Damn it. <laughs> so that's the, the uh, in my opinion, that's the point of map level two. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show that up again real quick. Uh, that is where your key was found that kind of describes all of the little objects. You see some hand carved tunnels, um, circular stairs, all that kind of thing. But the only thing that really pops out as a, a ooh, ah, wow moment, whereas you had the cool little traps, the eight magic items, you had the pissed off ogre magi, the oni that was giving out cursed weapons, and you had the massive amphitheater battle with the golem. Here, the only thing that really happens is when you find yourself uh, down in the uh, central area where Tomorast, the wizard who has taken over the dungeon, resides. He's got peak holes cut out through his lair, centered, that keep an eye on, on the rest of the movement. He can use some casting to keep that up. But really, man, uh, until other than that... There's a big old huge huge gigantic organic uh, black mold in room 45. Excuse me, a, a brown mold, russet mold for fifth edition people. Um, but yeah, other than a few NPCs, that's really it. So you're gonna have to manage moving the NPCs around this level to harass the party without revealing them until you get into your final combat for the level. Um, you want Tomaras to be the 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 big bad for this level but not the uh, big bad for the dungeon. They go, wow, that's tough, but there had to be something bigger behind them. And there's some, some a little bit of text here and there. I'm probably going to spoil a little bit. The big bad at the end of it is this big old honking demon guy uh, that's been trapped down here, brought Tomaras down to try to help him break himself free. Tomaras has him trapped and is drawing power from him. A lose-lose for everybody. Now, one thing of note is... On this level, there's something called a purple stone that's hidden in one of the rooms, 47. Uh, or is that on level 3? No, that's 47. Um, if the party gets there, feet meets a certain couple conditions, they get some temporary buffs, some temporary spell conditions are applied to them. Beneficial <clears throat> to help them with the rest of it. So, um, yeah, level two's done. This is a DM heavy prep as far as you need to make this level feel alive. With the cadre of bad guys that are given you, the expectation as a DM is using their knowledge to move about this, leading the party astray, leading them into the few traps, confusing them, separating, befuddling them until the final battle. That's what level two is for, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and switch over to level three right quick. Um, I think I can do that. By going to here. And we're going to go to. Yay. All right. Let me adjust it ever so slight so you can see it. All right. Level three of Morton Caden's Fantastic Adventure. Where it gets a little bit thicker. Um, most of the enemies here are gnolls. Large packs of gnolls. Like 16, 14, 16, 20. Some cold chillins, some minor demons, um, another couple magic using, a, a cluster of magic users that are in service of 
uh, Kurzit and Kurzit himself, Kesrit, Kurzit, the uh, demon. I would say he's on par. Uh, I wouldn't say he's a prince. Um, it's take the idea of a Balor, a Bal a Balor, a high level demon that doesn't run their own lair, but is enough. I think I like the idea that they used Kurzit as this strange incantation of its own being. He's not powerful enough to run a lair, but he's powerful enough to whip some butt. Cool. He's it is the big bad. He is interwoven in these back hidden chambers. The party will come down this stairway basically and have to find their way through the dungeon. They'll come down by 51, 53. And again, it's a maze. It's a labyrinth. A lot of the tunnels just back up on themselves. There's not a ton of, of uh, creatures down here. Clusters of gnolls, clusters of colchin, which are... are low-level, mid-level custom fiends uh, that were put into here. Um, group of assassins. Killers, as they're called. Assassin level 6, which is an assassin level 6 for a CR6 for 5th uh, for edition. So you've got the stat blocks ready for most of these already in 5th edition. Number 1 is... Working the gnolls in clusters to either lead or harass the party as they move around. As written, you've got about 32 to 40 gnolls divided into two different colonies that call this home. Uh, the knoll room, the red lit chambers. Whether you want them following the party around or not, similar to the second level. Um... Torture chambers got the assassins hanging out in it. Uh, road room. You know what? There's not a ton of stuff in here that really mess with to really mess with the party, other than just the confusing layout of it. Once again, you have the confusing layout. Um, <coughs> dude, it's almost like they put a lot of the um the cool stuff on the first level for you to run into. Didn't add a whole ton of, of neat little tracks and trips on the lower. It's just, you know, the more you read through it, the more you look at it. It Level 2 is being hunted or hunting down a cluster of magic users and their mercenaries while navigating a, a somewhat complex dungeon. Level 3 is dealing with several groups of gnolls that you chase or chase you around um some gross stuff for content uh colchin which are some low level fawns demon spawn whatever you want to call them fiends excuse me um yeah man it's it's gonna be up to you as a dm if you take morden canaan's fantastic adventure amazing adventure to turn it into something with everything um the encounter with Kurzit could be challenging once you upscale him, them. The There is a couple special items that were left here. The Tome of the Black Heart, the Sword of the Ebon Flame, Potion of Controlling Damage. There's a few specific magic items that were built in with this that would be end up being found over in the, the yucky area. So it's like we're looking at the level 3 map. You've got a collection of dungeons. You've got 20 key things. Five of them are occupied. The rest of them are descriptive. Um, and then one big bad that hides out in a series of caves and waits for the party. Uh, man. This is me going into personal uh, opinion and commentary. And this is me playing, expressing an opinion on a game that's been running for a couple years. Or, or a couple decades. The premise for this adventure is cool. The name on the cover probably sold more than anything. The set pieces and events on the first level are fun. The idea of pursuing a party and tricking them with a group of mobile NPCs on the second level is interesting. Getting to the third level, relying on yet 
the same thing, one or two small events, lots of gnolls, um, and one cluster of, of fiends and one big monster. It's a little disappointing, man. You know? I mean, we'll just even read the description for room 62 out loud it seems as you're looking at the the third map uh that's 61 and 62 the uh the chapel looks like a large set piece right the entire area is lit by lanterns suspended from the ceiling at 20 foot intervals pews are arranged facing a raised pulpit and altar area there are four sections each with five pews that seat six per pew for a total of 100 pe total capacity of 120 people the first three rows of pews look more worn and used than the remainder, suggesting the congregation is scanty at best. Stairs lead up to a pulpit where services for the following followers in this complex are held. To the right and left of the pulpit are three-foot-tall granite statues depicting slaves bowing in submission. Behind these is a granite altar. The altar is ten-foot long by four-foot wide and has a silver ewer and obsidian ritual dagger upon it. The ewer and the altar are caked with dry blood while the dagger has been used often and retains some stains. Nothing else here, man. There's a stairway that leads an altar that leads from 63 to a deeper complex. Um, so, in reading from rear to beginning, which is what you would have to do with this module to understand it, um, the level first level exists entirely on its own second level is the start level of the cultists Kurzit, uh tomarast and his guys hang out there tomarast should not fight to the death on the second level he should take any of his forces that survive and retreat to the third level to warn Kurzit. so the idea is that most of this unpopulated space on the lower on the third level would be populated by the survivors of the second level. So now you're managing two different levels worth of NPC waves to work together to keep the third level challenging. Uh, there's another module called Forgotten Temple of Thar's Dune that follows this exact same pattern. Uh, a little cleaner makes a little bit more sense. Uh, my, my, my opinion as a review the this module WG5 Gordon Kanan's Fantastic Adventure is a very interesting intricate dungeon design undone by a lack of fun enemies a lack of events you've got 62 keyed locations and 67 keyed locations and if my count is correct you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten monster clusters spread out through the 62 locations on three levels to occupy your party. Uh, so mathematically, you're looking at an encounter, a combat encounter every six rooms. That's slow. That's a slow pace. And we're going to take it a step farther and say that there's maybe five true trap, nah, 12 trap event rooms set in here. And I'm going to eliminate three of those because they're already combined with other events. So mathematically speaking, and not even including all of the amounts of open, unlabeled space on your map, for every six rooms that your party has explored, they will have a one in three encounter of finding anything other than an empty room. Not the most thrilling use of, of several sessions um, by my count, even if your party is able to knock out 10 of these encounter rooms per session, you're looking at six sessions, and so you're looking at two things happening per session if you run this thing as written. That's kind of low-paced for modern standards. So am I saying don't play this dungeon? No. I'm saying it's a cool dungeon that if you pick it up, make sure to read it back 
front to back and then back to front. So you understand the expectations in what the dungeon master needs to do. Make sure you understand that the first level in of itself is self-contained. Nothing is going to affect it from the lower levels. The lower two levels, you need to coordinate the forces. You need to make sure that things survive and move amongst each other. Uh, you're running constant moving battles with the, de with the uh, defenders of the dungeon in the hopes of drawing them down into the chapel area or Kurzut's lair for him to nom nom on. A couple really cool things at the start. Item destroyers, funky candles, cursed items, ghostly uh, event, you know, a big massive brawl with the iron golem with a bunch of specters and magical spectate. It, it, a big event. And it goes from that to claustrophobic tunnels filled with double backs, doors that lead to nothing, the occasional trap, and not a whole lot of monsters. If you're good at drawing your own map and want to build your own map, you'll probably do better than what's been presented here. I hate to sound that way, man, because, man, I'm a, I'm a fan of classics, but i got to be honest. Knowing what I know now, building content that I build, making dungeons, running, running campaigns, if you buy this... If you play it, it's purely for some nostalgic purposes. It's to be able to say, hey man, let's play Morden Cannon's Fantastic Adventure, where we play as Morden Cannon and Rigby Bigby and Backwards Gary and explore a module when they were in their youth. That's really it, man. There's better dungeons out there. There's way better dungeons out there. There's way better crafted adventures. Ultimately, it's a little bit of a letdown for what's on the cover. The name Morden Kanan's Fantastic Adventure. It's somewhat of an adventure. Morden Kanan's in it. I wouldn't call it fantastic. It's got the foundations for a lot of work to, to allow a DM to really populate it and, and add some extra threats to it. A couple of gelatinous cubes here and there. Maybe a couple gargoyles. Uh, a trapper. Um couple of cloakers in the in in the uh the the, mul the multiple garment rooms that you have not a single mimic in this hang is listed y'all come on man two three mimics so in 15 20 seconds we've talked about how okay we we got this module we want to do the history of it what do we do to make it playable number one you know how to do your stat blocks exactly what i said use some environment use some the area on the second level that's just repeating hallways, throw a freaking gelatinous cube in there that's rolling down it. Uh, your your, your uh, l trappers, lurker above, I think they're now the same, uh, same monster. Um, use some of those. Um, I'm a big fan of these little dudes called boggles. Anywhere where you have lots of doorways, lots of frames, lots of stuff, it's a little 1-8 CR fey creature that can just make people miserable. Um, they don't do a lot of damage, they're just enough to harass you but i mean i'm looking at maps that are full of doorways full of frames full of passages full of anything that a boggle can use to stick his arm through and stab you from a dimension door type thing all right um yeah make it your own add some elementals this is a this is a a powered this is a magical type of a thing there's a demon at the bottom of it so you have access to the elemental evils Maybe you throw one or two more elementals in here. Maybe something got away from the Oni on the upstairs. And, um, you know, there's an earth elemental, a Zorn. You know, um, something that can move through plain, can pass wall naturally, move through earth naturally, and found itself a nice little home here. Um, you know, you have a cool map. You have a cool premise. You just don't have a whole lot of stuff added to it. So, you know, get to work if you want to use it. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time with a group fumbling through dead-end halls, empty rooms, opening doors that lead to doors that lead to doors that lead to a hallway that lead back to another door. And, and 20 minutes later, this kind of sucks. I really don't want to be here anymore. You have to liven this dungeon up to keep to keep um, entertaining, I think, to keep it entertaining, especially for its size, man. It's way too big not to have more stuff going on in it. So... Um, yeah, that's my review and preview of WG5 Morden Kanan's Fantastic Adventure. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you've learned something from it. I'm going to close with one more quick and dirty 
view on uh, updating Beckme and 1E2E monster blocks to use them quick and dirty without having to build stuff, just making a couple quick notes. We're looking at Colchin, the funky little thing I was talking about, a little uh, fiend. Armor class 4, 20 minus 4, 16. So we have a translated 5e armor class of 16 assigned to this creature. Eh, kind of tough. Hit dice 4 to 7. So that's going to give us an average of 4 to 56. 4 plus 56 is 60 divided by 2 to get to my average. It gives me an average hit point of 30 for this creature. Armor class 16, hit points of 30. Uh, number of attacks 2, 4 to 9, 4 to 9. So... 9 minus 4 is 5, so you're looking at a 1D, a D4 plus 3. No. Uh, D6 plus 3. D6 plus 3. 1D6 plus 3 is, it says 4, 1 to 9, so you 1D6 for a slash plus 3 is a strength bonus into it, okay? Yeah, you'd think they could just do that one little thing. Sometimes you got to do quick subtraction for your 5th edition blocks. Um... Oops. So we're here looking at the Colchin. Once again, um, armor class 4, 20 minus 4, 16. So we're going to give him an armor class of 16 there. Hit dice 4 to 7. Remember, your base for 1E and Beckme is, is a D8 for your hit dice. So you're going to multiply those two numbers by 8 separately, add them together, divide it by 2, finding the average for the range. All right. Treasure type, doesn't really matter. Attacks, two attacks per action. Magic resistance, 20. I wouldn't say that's enough to give them resistance to where they have disadvantage advantage on saves. Uh, you might pick one or two things to give them resistance to, like they might be resistant to cold and uh, necrotic, for example. That's up to you. Play with it how you want. Uh, just shows you they have a little bit of resistance. Dumb as hell. Uh, next thing, level XP value, 4 to 7. Uh, so we're using the, the, the 7 version of it. So 7 gives you your plus to hit. So he has a plus 7 on his two attacks to hit. Divided the 7 gives you the 3. The 3 on the strength bonus already built into that. So armor class 16, 30 hit points, 2 attacks with a plus 7 to hit on each attack. Each attack is slashing damage. It will do 1d6 plus 3 damage should it land. This creature has resistance to cold and necrotic. We're done. I don't, as long as you jotted that down in your little notebook while you're DMing, you don't need to build a stat block. You just need to remember how to do the quick and dirty math to make these creatures line up with whatever edition you're using. And in my opinion, it works very well for Beckme and 1E uh, and 2E. 3E is a different ball of wax. You've got your standing armor class, your touch armor class, your ready armor class, blah, blah, blah. It's touch hit, damage hit, da, da, da. So, I mean, that's a different ball of wax on its entirety. We'll, we'll tackle that later. But I'm going to go ahead and end now. Um, in summary, WG5, other than its name, including Morden Kanan, is a mediocre adventure. The maps are fun. Going to take a lot of work to liven it up. It starts really strong, ends really well. But we'll say it's a 10 book, a 10 chapter book. Chapters 1, 3, and 10 are cool. Chapters 2, 4 through 8, eh, no, you're going to have to rewrite them to have fun with it. Um, but yeah, so that's when I, where I'm going to end this stream. I'm going to end this recording. Uh, again, thank you for watching me if you've been sitting here on Twitch. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you're catching me on YouTube, I appreciate your time. Wherever you, wherever you are, thank you for your time. Uh, like and follow, subscribe, do all of that cool stuff. I will be continuing this series. Again, I've got gigabyte upon gigabyte of old PDFs from classics from B2 Keep on the Borderland all the way up to 5th edition third-party content that we'll be playing with this with. Um, excuse me, that we'll be spending time reviewing and, and uh, translating back and forth. So uh, thanks for joining me, and we'll catch you guys soon.